Welcome to the final episode of Series 27. This is another Amelia-free episode, aside from this cold open. <laughs> but once again, Alex Flanagan did an amazing job. Uh, you can find more info about Alex's great work in the show notes. We do have a quick announcement to make about our schedule going forward. Mm -hmm. For a little while, we're not totally sure how long, um, we are not going to be doing our regular Character Evolution cast episodes. We will instead be taking a week off between each series. Uh, many of you are aware of my delicate mental health situation. Most of the time I do my best to not have it affect the show and the work that we do here, um, but my issues have been particularly bad lately, and it's left me feeling really drained, both physically and creatively. Because of that, we have chosen to pause that part of our show until I'm feeling a little better and am more able to fully contribute. We are going to miss doing it. It's one of my favorite parts of the show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really sad that we're putting it on hold, but I think it's the better choice for my health and well-being right now. Um, it's not permanent. It's just a pause until I feel better. Please, soon, hopefully. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm really struggling, y'all. Yeah, we are um, all rooting for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's not a thing that we wanted to do or a choice that we made lightly, but I think um, for the longevity of the show, it's it's better to take a break from that and mm -hmm. not burn out completely. Yes. And right now, that's just a thing that I need. And sometimes admitting where your shortcomings are is the best thing that you can do for yourself. So yeah, this is Absolutely. this is where I'm falling short right now. Mm -hmm. So. And I, I, I just want to add that it, it, not only you, um, I mean, it was it was also me feeling a little bit of the burnout as well, um, especially with all the stuff that's going on in the world right now. And Yeah, life and is just a lot right now. Like, it, even it if you're really doing is. great, life is just a lot right now. Like, mm -hmm. take a minute, everyone. Give yourself some credit. We are living in interesting times, and mm -hmm. it's exhausting. And it's okay to be exhausted, and it's okay to be burnt out and to just not be able to do all of it right now. Yeah, and uh, what what's going to be nice about these little breaks is you'll have a little bit more time to catch up on the show. I know a lot of people aren't able to uh, have their commutes now True. Uh, for a while, and so they have less podcast listening time. So uh, if, if you are spending your time, uh, if, it, if it's less than normal, if you're spending that time listening to our show, we thank you immensely uh, for sticking with us during all of this. Absolutely. And honestly, you're welcome for the break. You know, we just mm -hmm. we don't want to overwhelm you with our good, good content <laughs> is really what this is about. I lied. It's not about me. It's just, we don't want to overwhelm you, the listener. <laughs> We're going to give yep. you a break. Yep, there we go. <laughs> yep. We'll, we'll we'll fix that in the, uh, the post edit somehow and, and make it sound like that was our case the entire time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> or not. Either way. All right. Well, if you are looking for a way to help us both feel better in the meantime, uh, you can go ahead and consider leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podchaser, uh, or your app of choice. Uh, we always enjoy getting them and reading them. Uh, like this one we got from The Dark Fiddler on Podchaser. C3 is a wonderful way to expose yourself to new games. By focusing on character creation, perhaps one of the most wide-reaching parts of gaming, you get to see a lot of what really makes a game tick. Ryan and Amelia are great hosts with a good chemistry, and their guests are always passionate about the game being discussed. Put it all together, and you get a wonderful podcast. Well, thank oh, you. thank you. Yeah, that was nice. That was nice. That's what I needed today. Yeah. So send in your reviews, and it'll make us happy. Yeah, we say it every time, but it really does. It really, really, really does. <laughs> <laughs> well, with all that out of the way, here's the episode. Enjoy. Welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created characters and a village for Flatland Games is Beyond the Wall. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. We are so excited to welcome back 
Adam Stewart. Thank you, Adam. Do you want to go ahead and reintroduce yourself again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the character that you made in our last episode? Sure. So um, I am um, Ryan's uh, longtime friend and uh, current uh, uh, role-playing uh, uh game master and one of our uh, groups together and whatnot so you're your own person too that's Adam. right <laughs> my identity is, is linked to ryan in every way um yeah and so um i well my character i had um created thil uh he is the um what was my playbook the self-taught mage and he's an orphan um we learned that he had to do a little bit of um fighting and defending himself as a child and he is uh, we talked about a godfather and then i was reminded that i was an orphan i thought of that after <laughs> after the fact I was like, mm-hmm. oh, hmm, maybe maybe this godfather of mine who also um has some uh, magic background he might have been my guardian uh, maybe mm-hmm. cool. growing up and whatnot. So, so that's mm-hmm. the the character. I'm pretty much the uh, the the full mage um, of our group. I think. Mm-hmm. All right, Alex. Uh, why don't you tell us about yourself and your character? Uh, we are the same. I actually don't know where one ends and the other begins now. We're, <laughs> since the last episode, we have melded and unified <laughs> in my brain. You know what? That makes sense. <laughs> Like it tracks right like knowing <laughs> right? what we know about this character I, I really do feel a spiritual kinship absolutely um, actually so <laughs> i'm alex flanagan you can find me on twitter at coffee detective c-o-f-f-3-3 detective more interestingly you can find me on a couple of different podcasts i am the co-host of the cryptid keeper podcast where we talk about various folklore and mythology and critters that go bump in the night and then i am also the keeper for a horror borealis which is a actual play monster Monster of the Week campaign right here on the One Shot Network. My character, however, even more interestingly than me, <laughs> is uh, a rogue mage for our group. So that's like a hybridized class um, or classification, I guess. The actual class is Trickster Fox. Mm-hmm. And they are a literal fox who was raised by literal foxes before being raised by literal bears <laughs> before coming to a human village. Um, their name is Bettany Fiddlefern Crushpaw. And I love them with my whole heart. Um, (laughs) Bettany has like an interesting thing going on where they were, again, raised by foxes and then raised by bears. Um, They ended up in this human village because they made a foolish boast and then felt compelled to see it through. So I kind of envision that like Bettany's whole deal was probably they were, you know, roughhousing with their, their bear siblings and cousins at one point. And somebody somewhere was just like, hey, bet you couldn't go just, like, become a part of that human village. Like, bet I can. (laughs) And um, now here we are. Bettany lives with Grandmother Weaver, who is sort of an old folk witch, um, definitely the oldest person in town and has been the oldest person in town since the next oldest person can remember. (laughs) Um, And I hang out in her yarn basket. I I curl up and nap on her her old yarns and tapestries and things. And uh, she teaches me spells and lets me help with collecting potion artifacts. So that's kind of my deal. I love Bettany. Thank you. I do too. (laughs) I'm, I'm enormously fond of Bettany. Absolutely. And uh, Ryan, can you tell us about your character? Absolutely. So I made uh, Elise. Uh, she, her pronouns. Uh, Elise is the heir to a legend playbook, which uh, is as grandiose as it sounds. Uh, her father, uh, a quote unquote simple innkeeper, uh, actually boasts about various tales of adventure from his youth. Um and conveniently forgets to leave out that these adventures were uh, not only real, but also with uh, Elisa's mother and his current wife, as well <laughs> as the, the local blacksmith in town. And who knows who else? <laughs> Possibly that godfather, I'm thinking. Possibly, or or the wizard that visited the godfather or guardian. Uh, so there's there's a uh, a lot of history of adventure in this village, and Elise uh, basically inherited 
uh, this great sword that her father used on her adventures. And I want to say that this great sword kind of called to her. Her father probably never mentioned it, but it was locked away in the Ooh. attic of the inn. And one day, Elise stumbled upon it and and adventure found her. Was it like behind a humble tapestry or like hidden in the attic or like I want to say it was it, I want to say it was in the attic of the inn like wrapped up in like uh, a specific cloth um and like placed in a very like mundane mm -hmm. location kind of like hidden in plain sight. I love that. That's so fun. Yeah. Cool. Well, I love all of these characters. I would die for them. I would also commit many other crimes in there. <laughs> but anyway, let's go ahead and dive right into a segment that we are calling D20 for your thoughts. D20 for your thoughts. All right. In this segment, we want to talk to our guests about their thoughts on the character creation process and how it relates to this system and to other games. First, we like to get to know our guests a little bit better. So we're going to go ahead and get the uber cliche question out of the way, but it's still a good one. How did you get into RPGs in the first place? So I got into RPGs, um, I'm trying to think back. So this also ties into to Ryan. Um, so let's see here. We were in uh, junior high school. I recall mm -hmm. a very uh, primitive school newspaper. I think it was on eight and a half by 11 paper and, and Xerox. Mm -hmm. And there was an advertisement in it for an RPG club. And we mm -hmm. thought, hey, we like uh, role-playing video games like Final Fantasy. So this uh, um, this is probably all about video games or something to that effect. So, well, mm -hmm. we had no, at least I had no clue that there was such a thing as tabletop role-playing games um, mm -hmm. before we joined this, um, this group. And I think um, the first game we played was uh, Palladium's um, Heroes Unlimited which is mm -hmm. a, a superhero uh, game. And um, yeah, so this would have been, I think, what, seventh grade maybe? I think this was 93. I want to say eighth, eighth grade. grade. possibly. Okay. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so that, that's, uh, that, that was my first introduction into it and been kind of role-playing on and off for most of the years uh, since then. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's like a really neat entry point. I think a lot of people either have the answer or anticipate the answer that D&D &D would be like your first role-playing game for whatever reason. Um, so that's really cool. I, I've never heard of, of that game, but that's a cool entry point, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I think I had heard of D&D &D at that point mm -hmm. because of some of the various uh, video games I had played. Um, I think I had some of the D&D &D, like, uh, PC discs. Uh, games. I, I know that by the time I was in middle school, like I just assumed... D and D and tabletop games were the same thing. I, I don't think mm -hmm. I knew that there were others. Oh yeah, I had no idea. Sort of in the way that like frisbee means any flying disc mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, popsicle <laughs> means any frozen dessert. Like Dungeons and Dragons meant rolling dice and being an right. elf. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Awesome. Uh, so then, can you tell us about your personal process for picking and creating a character in any role playing system? Yes, I, you know, this is kind of a treat because I feel like I am usually a game master when I play. So my character, yeah. um, how I pick, I don't know if I have um, a general system other than I think I like to get, I like for the other players to play what they what really calls to them. And then I think I just enjoy filling in the gap and just working with whatever, um, might round the group out pretty well. So, um, mm -hmm. recently I had played in a shadow run group and, um, we needed somebody to be with, and that's just, and they call the face, you know, so the person that makes mm -hmm. the deals and, and uses the charisma mm -hmm. and that type of thing. So that was kind of an interesting challenge. So I just go with, uh, I think what, um, uh, makes, what kind of rounds the group out and it might be interesting, um, mm -hmm. you know, with, with the group as a whole. So I don't know if I, if I have any, anything more, um, formulaic, you know, than, than that. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I mean, I think that that's a really neat philosophy all in its own though, because that way you're setting yourself up to play a certain role in conjunction with the other players at your table. So, I mean, that isn't not a strategy. Mm -hmm. I think it definitely does speak to a certain kind of 
like optics that you have going on for yourself when you're looking what other people are doing and then saying like, okay, well, what do we have already? Like, what can I fulfill that'll be a different purpose right. than mm-hmm. anybody else in the group? Like, that's very cool. That That's not totally, you know, sh- shooting in the dark there. That's, that's a cool thing to be doing. Um, how do we think that character creation in this game stacks up to other systems that we've played? I, I enjoy the process. I think, again, it really um, shines when we're needing to create characters kind of, um, especially in the short term. I like it also for long term um, for campaigns mm-hmm. and whatnot, too. But I think it really stacks up well and that, OK, we got to get our creative uh, juices flowing. These tables kind of help us with a starting point, And then we kind of build uh, off of that. I think. Um, if were there if we wanted to go complete free form you know then then uh, a different system might um be stronger for that but um i think i think this one kind of works well um with giving mm-hmm. us a starting point and then and then we kind of break off of that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it feels very much like a mix between like standard dungeons and dragons and pretty much any powered by the apocalypse game mm-hmm. yeah i was going to say that there <laughs> That's my dog. Um, I was going to say that there is definitely something of a midpoint there. You know, it's it's definitely, you have this sort of very classical, like, rolling down tables and sort of, like, checking off boxes and building stats and, like, maxing out your character. Um, but it does also have something which I really enjoy, I think, probably most about this system, which is that you're building your character with respect to the bigger picture, mm. Which mm-hmm. is very cool. And that's not something that even all Powered by the Apocalypse games have. You know, I mm-hmm. I run Monster of the Week very regularly. <laughs> um, I've also <laughs> run Masks and I, I've played in some other PBTA games as well. And all sorts of different systems that all have various different things. And I've also written a few games. So I'm, I'm familiar with like character creation in general. And I have to say that this does a really good job of linking your character to like the fable of it all, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. like you, you really learn a lot about the community in the process of it, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. is something very neat. Something I did think was a little bit of a shortcoming of the system. And this isn't necessarily a criticism. It's just something that I would like more of is I don't feel like I understand my character's personality a lot. I feel yeah. like I know a lot about how they fit into the world and what function they serve. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I know about the nature of this town. But like, if we were to jump into role play right now, I would have no idea how to inhabit this character. Mm. I, I just don't, I don't right. know what they sound like. I don't know how they feel about the other people mm-hmm. around them. I, I don't really know them intimately from an RP standpoint, mm-hmm. which yeah, isn't what everybody is looking for in a tabletop mm-hmm. game. You know, some people want to encounter things and, and act bravely and swing big swords. And that's very cool. I am primarily a performer who turned into a game player. And so I like to tell that story. I like to know like the inside of my character's head Mm -hmm. a little bit more. Um, And so I kind of wish that we had more questions that dealt with the relationship between us. Mm. You know, the character like creation list told us like three times, like you guys are best friends, but answer a different question. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we still haven't talked at all at this point about our relationships to each other. Mm. Like that Mm -hmm. hasn't come up. And we could ostensibly start playing the game right now, and we still wouldn't know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good mm-hmm. point. Um, like, it, it gives you little nuggets mm-hmm. of personality here and there, uh, but you kind of have to extract yeah. that personality from those nuggets. Mm-hmm. It's it's kind of like getting a raw ore and trying to process that into, like, an ingot. It's not going to be... Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't just take that ore and plop it into a thing. You have to process it and do things to it, right? Um, to get that, which good can be stuff totally out. fine. But I feel like if you mm-hmm. had characters you were bringing to the table who weren't inherently comfortable yet being like confident role players or improvisers, mm-hmm. I do think they would struggle with that aspect of it a little bit because the game doesn't really yeah. hold your hand there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, observation for that. Um, and, and I'm trying to think of, um, cause as I was creating this character and as I was creating the character I used in my campaign, which I've talked about a little bit on the mm-hmm. podcast before, um, they, their personalities kind of just naturally built mm-hmm. in my head as I was going through, like what type of person would get into this situation? Right. What type of person would discover this? And, and it kind of went from there, but, but yeah, that, uh, now that I think about it, yeah, it, it was mostly from me and and not 
something that the game was trying to to show. Mm-hmm. And I think that probably has something to do too with the fact that this character creation is really driven by these random tables, which I did find really delightful. I thought they were very fun, but it yeah. means that there's not guaranteed cohesion as you go along. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. you're not guaranteed a narrative that informs a character. You're guaranteed a lot mm-hmm. of really interesting tidbits that you can then string together however you want, but yep. there's no necessarily like you're not promised that it will go somewhere that makes sense right away. Mm-hmm. It's not immediately yeah. apparent, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, like like for mine, um, I I had the question about the fisherman, and I I still have no like real connection mm-hmm. to this fisherman person. I'm like they're kind of a prominent person in this this play this character's life, but I don't feel that personally right, right now. They're they're just a name on a list at this point. Um, and, and I think maybe if it expanded on that a little bit, um, it, it could be a a little bit more powerful, a little bit more impactful. Um, uh, but also on the other hand, it needed a little bit more complexity to character creation. So finding that balance is, uh, is key. And I I mean, really interesting, uh, if the developers of this game, uh, listened to this episode (laughs) and, uh, let us know their, their thought processes on that. Uh, Because I I I would love to hear that I love this game so much, and I want to make it clear that's not like a criticism that I have. I just think it's it's something that is that bears noticing. You know, different games Mm -hmm. are really good at different things, and different character creation Mm -hmm. engines are really good at different things. This game has a lot of really cool strengths that I love that I definitely will like Mm -hmm. lock away in my head for the next time I'm writing something and probably steal. But um, (laughs) but that's just something that was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so how does the process of character creation uh, in this game set a player's expectations for actually playing the game? Hmm. Um, I, that's a good question. I mean, I think with a, a lot of um, – there, there's some assumptions. And, and one of the things that kind of came up was when we were talking about this, uh, when we were talking about the witch, for instance. Mm-hmm. There's some things that um, after – playing the game and then going through some of the material I kind of figured out after the fact and maybe that's that's maybe one one um, thing that could be a little bit stronger is that there there are certain things that are kind of taken for granted with the game that that the average player like like for me when I thought the village witch like what is she, you know, is she persecuted or, or what, or what is mm-hmm. this, uh, what is this witch? And then you kind of start to piece together with some of the, the material. Oh, uh, the witch is just uh, kind of like, um, a person in the village who's like their, like their, maybe their wise person or their medicine person, or, you know, a lot of times with, uh, when you're thinking of a witch, you might be thinking of a, like a more of a villainous uh, type of character or something mm-hmm. to that effect. So, I think um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I think with some of the uh, some of the, the tables and whatnot, they're gonna um, they're gonna uh, talk about different aspects of this world that um, start to give you a little bit of an of an idea of the type of world um, that that you're in, but maybe not um, not perfectly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think to sort of jump off of that point and what we were saying earlier, it's funny that you say that because um, maybe it's just the fact that my book was like inherently tied up with the witch to begin with. Mm-hmm. So I was like ready to be in that character's camp. But for me, when I hear of a village witch, like that's immediately a very strong positive association in my mind. Mm-hmm. Sure. But you know, like I grew up in like West Virginia, I come from this Appalachian folk tradition. And so like for me, a village witch is like, that's an asset to your community. That's sure. somebody mm-hmm. you have that like has a specific skill set and a wisdom and a knowledge that like you benefit from, that mm-hmm. everybody benefits from. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, maybe they're ambiguous at worst, but and you're like, it's certainly not a kind of person you want to make mad, but a good person mm-hmm. to have and an even better person to be living in their yarn basket and benefiting from their secret knowledges. <laughs> but I think that the, The way that this character creation is set up, sort of the way that it relies on these different story elements that get woven together, it really sets the expectation for me that the story in this system is not really about me. It's about this bigger fable that we're Mm. like playing into, Mm -hmm. if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Like this is a much more sweeping thing than any of us individually. You know, like even our individual stories, they feel less like individual 
stories that are significant on their own and more mm-hmm. like stories that play into each other in ways that will inform the world. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, we have a character who is an heir to a legend. And even that is yeah. really like not so much about you in the same way that like a legacy playbook and masks would be. It's really mm-hmm. more about the way that you inform us of something about this world as a whole like well what's the legend what's the legend that you're inheriting you know who is that coming from Mm -hmm. how are you going to live up to that like but more importantly who are you doing it with and what great deeds are you going to accomplish like you start to build out your own little fellowship here and you're sort of pulling Mm -hmm. from all these fantasy tropes and these ways that are much larger than life Mm -hmm. and it feels a little bit less intimate and a little bit more like sweeping and grand and I think that's kind of mm-hmm. cool, but that definitely paints a very different picture to me than some other character creation engines have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we did talk about this a little bit, or at least I did. <laughs> so I know <laughs> I don't want to talk over everybody else. I'm going to kind of like step back on this one. But um, what do you all think is one of the biggest flaws of character creation in this system? Um, I, 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 for me, and I enjoy it a lot. I think depending on the player. Um, they might feel when they're rolling, especially when they're rolling on the table, sometimes there's, there's some very specific things uh, that mm-hmm. come up. And I, I think some people might f- uh, find that somewhat constraining that they have to kind of fit uh, the results of this table into their concept of, of the character um, when mm-hmm. they might prefer a little bit more uh, flexibility for me, I, I kind of like having that solid point and then kind of building off of that. But I could mm-hmm. definitely see um, that not being uh, something that maybe everybody would would um, find to be, um, you know, a strength of the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I I think um, yeah, I want to say it. I wanted to say that the the character creation system is deceptively simple. Um, where it, it, if you approach it at like, here's the playbook Mm -hmm. and here's the questions and whatever, um, it's pretty easy to, to create characters, but, um, you can get super in depth and I'm not saying that this is actually a a super flaw or anything like that of the system, but you can, you can build pretty much any archetype you can think of by by creating a bunch of different Mm -hmm. things and putting them together. And um, it's interesting that there's, there's not like this, you're, you could be a fighter or you could be uh, like a masks legacy, or you could be this Um, you've got these like kind of archetypes, but these archetypes are, are basically just a bunch of puzzle pieces thrown together into, into these different archetypes. And if you just change a few pieces here and there, now it's a different archetype. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I think like if the more characters that you make, um, the more similarities mm-hmm. you'll be kind of finding. For sure. Um, I think that that's probably like the one of the biggest flaws I can think of. Yeah, I think the uh, the, the best way to counter it is just to try to pull together all those different playbooks. But I could definitely yeah. see if you had, uh, say, you're just using those six base playbooks, you you. Yeah, you would start to see the outer edges of what you could make pretty fast, I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. I could also see it being um, a bit of an issue where, like, just the sheer number of factors that these random tables start to bring in, if you happen to have a game where everybody rolled in ways that didn't really complement each other, you could end up with a world Mm -hmm. that had a lot of factors that didn't really conjoin together in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And that could make it really difficult for a GM to give something satisfying to everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That just, you know, it it would create a lot of errant directions that might be hard to unify into a world that felt lived in and like had direction Mm -hmm. to it. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's interesting because I I look at um, our group Mm-hmm. Right. And we're going to get into this a little bit in the next segment. Um, we've got myself, which is got this huge story point right. built into the character. Um, Adam's character has a pretty decent sized story point of this, this tome of magic linked to this like forgotten wizard of some sort. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got this this actual fox. <laughs> I'm just a literal that, fox. <laughs> yeah, that's that's magical, and and it hasn't been 
um, explicitly pointed out that I know of that you can talk or not. <laughs> <laughs> I can. That was in some of the other places in the tables. It just didn't come up in any oh. of my answers. But right, that is oh. wild. Yeah, no. Right? So you're you're very right. We have a party with three people. Two of them have tremendous burdens of destiny. And then I am just, I, I am the sassy animal sidekick who... Um, Mm -hmm. wandered into town on a dare and never went back uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> i think in the i think in the the supplement where the playbook came from they do give you some background as to what is the deal with this <laughs> and if just uh, off the cuff i think i think it had to like in this world there's just kind of at random all of a sudden intelligent foxes mm -hmm. and there's a few other details in there <laughs> like sometimes they have two two tails i don't know where yeah. that comes from and whatnot but um but uh, yeah, there is some rough explanation uh, to that. But yeah, yeah. And it's it's also an interesting thing because like some of the options that were on the tables that I could have rolled did paint to like a larger story, and a couple of them I did roll mm -hmm. and I just said no to. <laughs> like there was yeah. one option I could have had where like my family was killed by like beast like men from the north, and I just yeah I didn't feel comfortable creating or living in a world where there was any group of like humanoids that was equivocated to savagery like i just i don't i want to stay far mm -hmm. away from that trope um and Absolutely. i also just didn't necessarily want my backstory to be that like my whole clan was slaughtered you know like that's that's not fun yeah. for me after a point <laughs> um like i get it it has its place on fantasy and that's all well and good but like i'm a talking fox i, I don't need to have <laughs> just super dramatic mm -hmm. backstory or another one could have been that, like, my ultimate goal was to, like, uh, face off against the the longstanding enemies of my people. And I'm like, well, which people? The foxes or the bears or the humans? Or like, mm -hmm. It just gets kind of muddy after a certain point, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I think there definitely is, like, a tonal difference between, like, the core playbooks and sort of these expansion books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's interesting because you you noted that the witch finally figured out that you were something special because uh, you kept following her on these dangerous mm -hmm. trips for herbs, and it wasn't because uh, you started talking. <laughs> 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 You're just a mundane talking fox. <laughs> well, maybe the witch can talk to all animals, and so she just yeah. didn't well, that, notice. I mean, that's very possible. <laughs> yeah, um, I also, I also like, and I don't, I don't want to tread on your character at all or anything like that. But I, I had this interesting thought of what if you could only talk to people that that knew that you were magical. That's also interesting. Yeah. Um, or I, I kind of also like the idea of like maybe I just fully can speak English all the time, um, but I so rarely like. I just refuse to do it in front of people who aren't like my friends. It's like a Michigan J Frog situation where it's uh -huh. like, look at our magic talking fox. And I'm just like, <laughs> nope. <laughs> I'm just a fox. I, just I mean, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So let's get into uh, my favorite point of the discussion portion of the show. Uh, the fan fiction portion of the show uh, where we get to kind of talk about what, how, how did our, group get together and and where can we see us going what like what sort of adventures would we would we kind of go on so maybe how how did we how does this ragtag group of people uh including the fox uh get together hey you know well i think that there are some clear lines between the two of you at least right mm -hmm. like because part of what's so cool about this story that we did end up setting up in this this sort of world that we created in this town is that it has this very unique position it occupies where it's sort of the quiet place of retirement of some very notable heroes who have just yeah. sort of decided to enter this quiet portion of their life and so you both are sort of standing in the shadow of that legacy. And that's kind of a cool and incredible thing. But also I get the feeling that like, one, we decided that the archivist is like your god, the mage's godfather, Phil's godfather, and that the archives are attached to the inn and that the innkeepers were both adventurers who may or may not have been on adventures with the archivist. So mm -hmm. like, I think that there are some... Like, you probably would be neighbor kids that knew each other, I would think. Yeah, that would make a lot mm -hmm. of sense. Like, just kids that have grown up together in the village. Because mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that we're, we're probably roughly the same age. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I don't know if we've, we talked about that a lot, but um, the the assumption is for um, for a lot of the characters is that they're roughly teenage uh, 
mm-hmm. uh, in, in age. And then um, mm-hmm. there's the, the exceptions are they have uh, the playbooks that are the elders, which doesn't, mm-hmm. which could mean just generally adult uh, of some kind. And then there's the, the other races. So um, the elves or, or the talking foxes and those types of things. So, but kind I'm of a team talking fox. Yes. Yep. <laughs> At least in fox years or whatnot. I don't know. Yeah. I'm a fox uh-huh. team. Right. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think, it, um, especially w- with the core stuff, everybody's supposed to kind of have been, um, you know, the same age or kind of grown up together. Um, and whatnot, mm-hmm. so. <laughs> so I guess my question is, is how long has this Fox been in town? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the bigger question then is do intelligent foxes age at the same rate as foxes or do they age at the same rate as humanoids? Um, Ooh. Because that will drastically impact <laughs> what yeah. portion of my life any of those events has been. I mean, I would imagine for I don't know if it's specifically pointed out in in the rules at all. I don't think so. Uh, but I would Im- mm-hmm. I would imagine that uh, aging at the same rate as uh, a human or human equivalent uh, or or longer would be yeah a kind of a, of a more like interesting woodland spirit sort of deal where i actually yeah. age more slowly than humans mm-hmm. would be kind of fascinating yeah um, and it would be kind of interesting too because that would be something that i would literally not realize until mm-hmm. i came to this human village and then was like why are these humans living so fast mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah exactly like you just meandered it through the woods for who knows how yeah, long i spent some time <laughs> living with my, you know, my, my fellow kits and my fox yeah. den, and then I spent some time living with some bears who also cooked, and then I spent some yeah. time living with Grandmother Weaver, and heaven knows that she doesn't age at the same rate as normal humans, so, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I met a human kid, and then I saw it again a year later, and it was much taller, and I was very confused. <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering if uh, I'm wondering if one of the, the one of us was those that kid that you met. <laughs> Maybe <ago. laughs> um, I don't I don't think I've been in this town. Like I certainly wouldn't have been here when you were like young young children, yeah. like not toddlers. Um, maybe like five years. So like maybe if we're all sort of. 16, 17 now, um, you know, around the time that you would be, like, preteens starting to get into some shenanigans, sort of mm-hmm. realizing, like, you know, this is my magic book, this is my magic sword, sort of like the call of destiny weighing upon you. I, I think fate mm-hmm. would have conspired to bring me here around the same time that those things were kicking mm-hmm. off. I like that. That's pretty cool. Hmm. So, okay, so we've got childhood friends. We've got uh, a fox that showed up uh, around the same time as all this other stuff started happening um, that that kind of pushed us into this uh, uh, direction of destiny, I mm-hmm. guess you could say. Um, and I, I want to say, like, foxes in the village is not really a thing that is seen <laughs> too much. Right. Um and and maybe maybe it's getting a little bit more prominent ever since uh, that that special place in the gate uh, mm-hmm. has been uh, secretly found, uh, and maybe you're leading uh, some some old friends <laughs> into the village every now and then, or some old friends are coming to see you. Who knows? Um, but I, I would imagine that uh, just out of pure curiosity, we'd probably be like kind of gravitated towards. Uh, this this magical sort of fox, especially, um, I think Elise would be really fascinated based upon tales from mm, from her father. Yeah, for sure. Be like foxes aren't supposed to be around here, but you know my my dad talked about this magical talking fox. I wonder. I've never seen this fox talk, but it's been <laughs> here for for a couple of years. Maybe, and then and then maybe maybe a friendship sparked up by that. Oh, yeah, for sure. I think that definitely, like, you know, as great and wonderful as Grandmother Weaver's Yarn Basket is and as fantastic as um, that life may be, I do get bored. I do get curious. And I definitely mm-hmm. would just be, like, ambling around town. Um, and I think, you know, I, one of the, the questions that I rolled on was this idea of, like, I know these like charming ways and these like fun, clever little rhymes and these, these sneaky things. And I have these like little charisma spells that I can do. And I think part of the impression I was getting is very much that like, I tend to try to like 
charm and win over people with my adorable ears and my my beautiful beautiful whiskers and my <laughs> lovely flickering tail to just like kind of get things that I want and if one of those things is that the food in the inn smells particularly good on a certain night or it's <laughs> raining and grandmother weaver's not home to open the door and I just want to crawl up in front of the fireplace like I mm-hmm. think that hanging around the inn is definitely a thing I would do um and it might even be a thing where like Maybe your mom runs the bar or whatever, and Mm -hmm. there would be evenings where, like, I would sort of gravitate to her because she has sort of an adventurer's energy about her. Or you had mentioned Mm -hmm. that she was maybe, like, the rogue or the wizard. Not not the wizard, but, like, sort of the rogue for your group. So maybe she has some sort of experience with, like, not necessarily animal handling, but, you know, Mm game-recognized game. A fox is a rogue, and I think that I would recognize, like, this Mm -hmm. is somebody who is a kindred spirit. I will Hmm. hang out and talk to this person. Maybe your mom has known for a while that I talk. Oh, yeah. That's very possible. And and probably just hasn't said anything because, you know, trying to to keep her daughter safe from Mm -hmm. the grandiose time of adventure. But, you know, ever since (laughs) that that sword came out of the attic, Mm -hmm. (laughs) why why stop it when when it's (laughs) staring us right in the face? I think maybe even like... Maybe your mom has the gift of fox speech. And so the first few times that, like, we spoke, we actually just spoke in fox. Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, she would see me hanging around and she would be like, oh, hey, you know, little fox, what's going on? And I'd be like, oh, cool, you speak fox, so I'm not going to use English. (laughs) Uh Why would I do that? That's awesome. I like that. Yeah, that's very cool. So uh, what sort of adventures are we going to go on? Like we've we've got mm. this uh, this ancient city that uh, is underwater where this tome came mm-hmm. from. Uh, maybe we want to get more of that. That seems like an end game sort of scenario, though. Yeah. Uh, um, I wouldn't want to delve in a underwater dungeon at level <laughs> one. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, there's there's something special about this sword. Mm-hmm. Um. You know, we also have a link to like woodman woodland animals and yeah. Um, we also have um, there was mention of something about this town educating like watchmen or guards in yeah. like a particularly notable fashion. Mm-hmm. So it might be either that like some of the youth of this city are called up to help elsewhere. Mm. Um, or that something happens to a group of students on their way to our village, and we mm. are sort of like, well, heck, you know, we want to get out of this small town. Like, let's go check that mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really like the the stumbling into uh, heroism mm-hmm. uh, trope, where we're just kind of in the right place at the right time. Yeah, to help, and uh, and then and then we help. And then we're like, hey, this is kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It might even be something as simple as, like, this new class of uh, of students, like, comes to our town and they finish their training and they're on their way back to whatever city. And, like, one of them has forgotten something or left something behind. And we're like, oh, shoot, we got to go, like, head out on the main road and catch up with them. This is an mm-hmm. easy thing to do. Like, just send these teens after. They can't be that far out. Mm-hmm. So we, like, pack food for a day. And we head out. And of course, it's not a day. Of course, it ends no. up being like months and months and months because one thing turns into another thing. And one encounter with a, a group of forest bandits turns into uh, a, unraveling a scheme to sabotage the, the mm. watchmen of the great city and et cetera, oh, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Mm-hmm. I, I, I do like the the thought that our village is is kind of inherently tied to this big city. And some of the big city, like, underworld plots Mm. kind of spilling into the village as well. Work their way here. Yeah. Yeah, Some intrigue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah. Hmm. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of fun ways that this, this group could go. Or it could be something where, um, you know, maybe not like this tome itself is not the first lead that we follow, but... I know that, Adam, you had said that, like, this city probably doesn't have, or our town, rather, Mm -hmm. not going to do it the displeasure of calling it a city, but doesn't (laughs) have a lot of books. But that would naturally be a part of your education, and Mm -hmm. you're a self-taught mage, so you would need to advance your studies at some point. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was as simple as, like, 
hey, do you guys want to come with me on like a two day trip to the big city? Um, I talked to my mentor and they said that there are some books here, which I should go check out and like, hmm. you know, wrote to their friend over there who has these things waiting for me. So like, we're just going to go over to the big city, pick a couple of books, be right back. Yeah. And then the the, the big city sw- swallows us up into... Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very yeah, much right. so. Mm-hmm. I love the, munda- the, the mundanity of that where it's just like, we've never been to the big city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How hard can it be? Mm-hmm. Right. And then, yeah, the the grandioseness of this larger than life city just puts us in such a state of awe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that we get swept up in in whatever happens there. I also kind of like that too, because you know, if something that we're grappling with, even in our own town. And maybe we don't grapple with it so much in our own town. Maybe in our own town, it's nothing where it's just like, oh, yeah, you're the daughter of so and so. And oh, yeah. yeah, like you're, like we know that the legends live in this town. It's no big deal. But to go to this big city and like to meet all these people and we're like, oh my gosh, big city. And the people in the big city are like, y'all are from that place, right? Like <laughs> you must be so, like on some wild chosen one business. Like what is going on here? Right. We assume nobody had ever even heard of our village and whatnot. Right. Uh Yeah. And maybe we didn't even know that, like, we have this reputation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that would be super interesting because at the very least we would say, oh, yeah, we train the guards and everybody's probably like, yeah, that's the village where the guards come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's all. They they don't even know the name of the village. It's just blah, blah, blah. It's like, nope, there's there's something definitely more Mm -hmm. going on there. And a lot more people know about it than than just us in the village. Mm -hmm. Right. That that would be super interesting. Hmm. I like it. Oh, I love this so much. Cool. Is that um, if we don't have any other any yeah. other salient points to add there, then let's go ahead and get into our advancement discussion segment and take it up a level. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. I love that segment name. <laughs> Amelia does not. <laughs> In this segment, we will cover character advancement and growth in the system. Uh, So I guess the first question I have is, how do we think characters change as people within the narrative of the game? Mm -hmm. So in in one thing to point out quick um, for people that hadn't played the game before, another kind of one of the strengths that we're not really, I I think, probably going to be talking about too much is those scenario packs and that also mm-hmm. kind of um, gives gives each of us for instance there's going to be um, tables for okay what happened recently and then each of us are going to uh, have um, something kind of mysterious that's happened and mm-hmm. uh, while we were um, making our characters everybody I think the player to the right um, was with you uh, during some past incident well with mm-hmm. what happened recently it's the player to your left and then mm-hmm. uh, you're cool. going to do um, an ability score check and um, the other person can assist you either with fortune points or if they have a skill and then depending on if you pass or fail something something has has happened that that went um, uh, maybe turned out well or didn't turn out well but it's going to kind of foreshadow mm-hmm. where things are going so um, uh, for instance uh, if we're dealing with a, maybe a mysterious uh, magical cult you know something something happens and and um, you know we witness something or you know we save somebody uh, or something's kind of pointing towards something strange happening uh, in our in our little village or whatnot so mm-hmm. um, I kind of went off on a, on a tangent there um, but what uh, I, well where where I was kind of going with that is that um, we're uh, each of us, maybe we hadn't encountered too much um, in, in terms of uh, high risk or heroicism, but those are going to kind of pull mm-hmm. us in, and we're gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna grow in that in those regards in terms of um, how uh, our guess our characters as people we're gonna be facing challenges that they you know we hadn't faced before, and and grow in that mm-hmm. capacity and how we lean on each other and those types of things. Yeah, for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things uh, about actually playing the game is uh, like before each session, you roll those those random mm-hmm. tables. And um, I think uh, during our campaign, that's how I came to befriend a fey hound mm-hmm. um, that just randomly showed up in town because our, the, the adventure was all about uh, like dealing with some mischievous fairy folk. Mm-hmm. Um, and this fey hound kind of adopted my character. 
<laughs> um, because my character's charisma was very high, and I, that was the stat I had to roll mm -hmm. on for that. Nice. Um, and and that was right after I had learned how to bind a familiar and bound a uh, a panda ferret familiar uh, as my main familiar, and then this fey hound pops in, and now I had two pets. <laughs> oh, I effectively. love that. Yep. Nice fluffy dog with antlers and a panda mm -hmm. ferret. Uh, yeah, it's really interesting that uh, these random encounters definitely do, I can see, uh, add to the narrative of your character's story, uh, especially uh, relationships, too, because, like, as you said, it, it, it involves other players at the mm -hmm. table. Right. Um, and what's really cool is if you're doing a campaign and you don't sit at the same spot every time, yeah, it involves that is different people, mm -hmm. right? Every time, right? Which is I didn't very even think cool. about that. That's cool. Yeah, so like literally, the place that you sit in in real life matters mm -hmm. uh, in this game, which is it's cool. an incentive to sit next to new people. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> cool. So, how does a character mechanically level up in this game, and how do they change mechanically when that happens? Like, what mm -hmm. does that actual process look like? Yeah, so that's going to be kind of uh, traditional. So, um, and usually you don't deal too much with the leveling up unless you're going into where you're running the multiple adventures and or you're going into a campaign. Um, but on the, the last page of the playbooks, it's going to give uh, reference material. And one of them is your, um, your, your experience chart. And uh, it tells you for your class how many experience points are needed to advance to the next class and that's going to affect your base attack bonus and then each of your five uh, saving throw types and then of course your hit points are going to go up um, one thing that the game does a little bit different with initiative is you just get a flat initiative score um, so we don't roll for initiative each time but your initiative score is affected by your bonus the bon or I mean I'm sorry your, your experience level um, uh, goes into that formula oh, okay. and whatnot too so mm -hmm. um, and then there's different um um, options. Some of these are laid out in the further afield if you're doing a campaign, but you can also uh, at different levels get uh, additional skills go up with the uh, ability score points and then uh, mm -hmm. and, and whatnot. So, in terms of how you actually get experience, there's different um, uh, enemies are going to have different um, experience points assigned to them. But one of the things they point out in the book is not to focus on simply defeating an opponent in martial combat. For mm -hmm. instance, if you um, find a way to strike a deal with the uh, goblin to leave your village alone, that should be worth at least as many points as simply going up to him and and just beating him up and whatnot too oh cool i really really like that. yeah or or yeah exactly so there's a lot of it it, it um encourages you to approach it in a lot of different in mm -hmm. a lot of different ways and whatnot and then um uh, of course uh, for heroic deeds or good role playing there's going to be experience points associated with that too so for the most part it's a pretty traditional experience system mm-hmm and I really like in the uh, expanded further fields uh, supplement, they added character traits as yes. well, which mm -hmm. are, are kind of like feats from D&D, &D. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can only have traits if you have a true name. Mm -hmm. uh, so the true name is not like the name you were given at birth or anything like that. It's like this, uh, this concept of like you, you inherit this this true name of yourself and then if mm -hmm. somebody knows your true name they have a little bit of power over you um either in a good way or a bad way so you kind of mm -hmm. have to keep it secret um but like if if your healer knows your true name and invokes the true name when mm -hmm. they heal you you gain more hit points things like nice. that nice okay cool mm -hmm. But also having this true name allows you to select these uh, these traits that add some really, really nice bonuses. Um, uh, we didn't go into that in character creation here uh, because we wanted to keep it a little bit more basic. But level one, you can even start with a trait. And then uh, I think there's two more levels uh, by default that you get more traits, like level mm -hmm. five and, and something else. Yep. Um, and I think it even points out in there, it's like, if you want to have more traits, if, you're, if your whole group is fine with that, go ahead. Me. Um, it it's really points to the malleability of the character uh, advancement and generation in the system, where if you want to add some extra 
oomph to all your characters, feel free to do so. Mm -hmm. Which I really like. Yeah, I do too. Just don't go overboard, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, yeah. It'd be uh, easy to go overboard for Level sure. one, everybody starts with It's a game about traits. like people in a fantastical well. universe inheriting giant swords that are attuned to their spirit and uh -huh. like, fulfilling a grand destiny. Mm -hmm. Like, go as overboard yeah. as you want. That's why mm -hmm. you play a tabletop yeah. game. Absolutely. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. It's true. It, it was interesting in our campaign uh, that Adam and I are playing in, um, we didn't start with true names. It was like after the second adventure, or maybe after the first, I can't remember. I think it was after the second adventure, uh, we were kind of heralded as heroes of the village, and we gained true names through a like a, an elaborate ceremony mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, so we knew our true names, but nobody else did. So, like, I, just because I'm curious now... Um, and you don't have to tell me your true name because I understand that would be giving me and the audience a lot of power <laughs> over you. But what does a true name sound like? Like, uh, what sort of convention does it fall into? I want to say it could be anything. Um, like, my character's yeah. name is Elena Swan. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, well, gosh, what was her true name? Um, I, th I think it was, it was Arya something. Um, it was something Arya Swan. Um, uh, oh yeah, Luna Arya Swan. Sure. Oh, okay. So it, it was, it was kind of like Moonsan. Was so they're not just like all warrior cat names where it's just like power or like tiefling names where it's like, right. you know, a, a word that like encompasses you. It's, it's pretty it, much it, anything. It can just yeah. actually be another name. Yeah. That, that is uh, one thing that's kind of, um, struck me about the system is sometimes, um, and this can be good for, uh, again, um, allowing a lot of flexibility with the uh, game masters and players. But when you look at, for instance, uh, creatures, there is sometimes it's quite vague or you don't get much of a description. Or mm -hmm. there's oftentimes references to um, the fae, um, you know, the fairy folk. And... And there's not a lot of description about that. So sometimes I'm kind of digging around because um, in my mind I'm thinking about Tinkerbell or something to that effect. And I'm looking at, you know, ancient uh, Celtic, uh, uh, you know, fairy lore. And uh, <laughs> well, I'm getting a better a sense. I could help you with that. <laughs> right, right. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. uh, and and so, yeah. So for me, I've, I've, I've you know, it, it's forced me to kind of um, do a little bit more exploration because it doesn't uh, necessarily hand it to you. But mm -hmm. with the, the true names, it was kind of the same thing where I'm like, well, neat. The, yeah, in it, in it's somewhat, somewhat it kind of presumptive where it's like, okay, uh, true names, and and you're like, what is this all about, and why is this so important, and um, yeah, and whatnot. So I think some of it comes comes from some of that, um, uh, you know, um, some actual kind of folklore and those types mm -hmm. of things that uh, it's maybe assumed that you know that you know, like for me, I didn't know a lot of uh, stuff and so, you know, kind of learning some of that, uh, mm -hmm. some of that as I go. So, yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, is, is that everything that we can think of for uh, level advancement? Then I think so. Awesome. All right. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining us to talk about Beyond the Wall. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun with you guys. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you too, Alex. Thank you so much for filling in for Amelia. This was really yeah. fun. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was it was great. It was a really fun system to explore, and I'm glad that I got the chance to do it. Absolutely. Um, and, and Alex, do you want to give uh, your, your socials for everybody one more time? Yeah, sure. So if you're looking for me, um, the best place to do it is on Twitter. You can find me at Coffee Detective, which is C O F F three three Detective D E T E C T I V E. Um, you can also find me on the Cryptic Keeper podcast, where we talk about fairies, among other things. Mm -hmm. Or you can find me as the keeper of the actual play, a Monster of the Week podcast here on the One Shot Network, a horror borealis award winning, award winning podcast, <laughs> horror borealis. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again for sitting down to do this with us. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. 
Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can be found in the show notes. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review, we have links to various review platforms out there, including Apple Podcasts, in our show notes. Also, check the show notes for links to our other projects. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. We gotta read some show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Show blurbs. Character Creation Cast is hosted by the One Shot Podcast Network. If you enjoyed our show, visit oneshotpodcast.com where you'll find other great shows like System Mastery. System Mastery is a delightful stroll through the history of role playing games. Except the games are terrible and the hosts are real jerks about everything. Join hosts Jeff and John as they explore the weirdest games ever made to talk about what worked, what went wrong, and which Silver Hawk was the best. It was Hot Wing, don't even add us. Find their shows at SystemMasteryPodcast.com or OneShotPodcast.com. Finally. Thank you again for sitting down to do this. I can talk. (laughs) 